So there are different um, responses that people have to the same drugs. Um, in particular, uh, there are a couple explanations on why people may behave differently on alcohol. One um, proposed explanation is the uh, disinhibition in general and lack of impulse control. So uh, there's research that indicates that the higher cognition areas, like the cortical areas of the brain, are more affected by alcohol as compared to the subcortical or more basic processing areas of the brain. So the idea is that um, when someone consumes alcohol, the basic, like the basic um, areas of the brain are driving behavior more than the higher cognition areas. In particular, there is evidence that the frontal lobes, which are responsible, um, as you know, for decision making and reasoning, may be particularly affected even as compared to other lobes such as temporal and parietal. Um, Another explanation is learning. So people have expectations for how they might act under the influence of alcohol. If people think that they're going to get in fights and get really emotional, things like this, um, when they're using alcohol, they're more likely to act in this way. In fact, there have been studies done where um, people are told that they're drinking alcohol and they're not, and they act in ways that they expect um, people under the influence of alcohol may act. Another explanation is behavioral myopia. So um, if someone is myopic, they're nearsighted. Um, people under the influence of alcohol seem to respond to what's in front of them, some more immediate and salient information, um, um, while possibly ignoring longer term implications, more abstract um, implications of their actions, as well as more um, nuanced information. So they're just going, they're um, not as able to kind of process more complicated information and sort of act um, within this more basic um, framework. Uh, a quick note, you're, because I am um, relying heavily on the text for a lot of the material, your book does state um, that behavioral myopia can lead to risky behaviors due to lapses in judgment, and they included date rape in this. And I have to respectfully disagree with your book on this point. Um, According to information from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, there isn't evidence that alcohol creates um, a judgment lapse in people who didn't already have a problematic view of sexual consent. Um, and you're welcome to follow this link if you'd like to follow up on that. Uh, the idea is that research um, doesn't doesn't yet indicate, doesn't appear to indicate that um, someone has um, completely equitable and um, respectful views of sexual consent, drinks alcohol, and then commits date rape. It appears more that people who already have like um, problematic views of sexual consent, so maybe don't fully um, respect sexual consent, are disinhibited by alcohol and therefore are more likely to um, commit something like date rape. Okay, so individual differences in addiction and dependence. Um, in, in general, substance use is the pattern of use of a substance that is excessive and um, harmful due to the amount of the substance that is consumed. Um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, which is kind of the, um, the handbook for um, sorry, uh, diagnosing mental disorder, doesn't actually distinguish between substance abuse and dependence any longer. So um, it's just different levels of substance use disorder. Um, that we that we uh, diagnose anymore. Um, physical addiction is a physical dependence on a substance. So um, people that are physically addicted develop a tolerance where they need increased amounts of the drug to get the same effect. Um, they experience withdrawal when they cut back or cease use of the substance. Um, and there's also psychological addiction, which is a uh, psychological need for a substance that isn't um, a company that isn't rooted necessarily in the purely physical effects of the drug. Um, and you can look at this graphic up here to the right showing um, harm caused by drugs is often, um, like harm caused by drugs is calculated based on the harm to the user and the harm to other people. And interestingly, alcohol, which is legal, um, is considered one of the most harmful drugs, um, especially in its harm to other people. Um, which, it, which is kind of more proportional, more than half of the harm is harm to other people. Um, whereas heroin, which is highly addictive, is more likely to be harmful to um, the individual using it. And methamphetamine, 
um, extremely harmful to the individual using it, but not so harmful to others in general. Individuals have different responses to drugs, um, as I touched on earlier. So um, weight height obviously can have an effect on how someone um, responds to a drug. Um, females may be more sensitive to certain drugs as um, estrogen appears to interact with the addiction reward system in the central nervous system. Um, in general, in terms of epidemiological studies, men are still more likely to abuse, abuse substances. Um, and this is based on data from SAMHSA, which is um, kind of the main, um, one of the main uh, funding and research agencies for uh, mental health and substance abuse in the US. So if you look at this graphic, um, down at the bottom, men are more likely to abuse alcohol. And if you take, um, women are more likely to abuse, let's see, pain relievers, yeah, prescription pain relievers um, and amphetamines. Um, if you look at the numbers overall, men are a little bit more likely to um, abuse drugs based on treatment admissions. So there, um, it's possible that there's some chance that um, women have similar levels of addiction but are not as likely to seek treatment. It's possible. I don't think we necessarily have a final word on that. Older people are more sensitive to drugs in general. Um, the same drug can have the same effect on older people. So um, for psychotropic medications, it can be important or psychoactive medications that can be important to make sure that age is taken uh, into account. This is just a nice graphic um, showing uh, social harm, um, likelihood for dependence, and physical harm of, um, so harm to the individual of different drugs. So um, it's interesting to see discrepancies between these three types of harm. So for example, um, tobacco has um, relatively high dependence compared to the physical and social harm it causes. Alcohol, again, appears to have relatively high social harm compared to level of dependence and the harm on the individual. Um, ketamine can cause a, a relatively high um, harm to the individual compared to social harm and dependence, and heroin is just overall scary and terrible. There are um, several theories for um, why people use drugs, and the one that your book mentioned is this wanting and liking theory, which is supported by um, a fair amount of evidence. It's, um, it's also called the incentive sensitizing uh, theory, um, and this theory says that the desire for drug is elicited by cues associated for the drug. Um, so the idea is like wanting, which is craving, um, is uh, mediated by a different part of the brain as compared to liking, which is pleasure. So um, wanting is proposed to be mediated by the uh, mesolimbic dopamine pathway or the reward pathway, which is kind of what we think of also as like the um, addiction pathway. And then liking, which is the experience of pleasure again, is uh, mediated by the opioid systems. Um, and the theories, this theory, the wanting and liking theory, suggests that people start taking the drug because it's um, pleasurable, it activates the opioid systems, um, but then it kind of um, hijacks this mesolimbic dopamine pathway, this reward pathway, and people keep continue taking it because of cravings rather than um, the actual pleasure that this drug provides. Um, and this is backed up um, somewhat anecdotally by um, reports of people who have been addicted to drugs uh, especially highly addictive drugs such as heroin who say that they don't so much enjoy like the drug doesn't necessarily give them the same pleasure it did uh, they don't get the high that they used to but they crave it and they need it and um, they might also be using it to avoid the withdrawal symptoms which can be extremely averse um, so there's a indication of different types of addiction um, differences in the reward learning and learning the, um, of the association between the stimulus and reward and um, these multiple forms of addiction are just uh, based on Pavlo Pavlovian um, classical conditioning so if you remember Pavlov um, gave a dog meat powder or something like that and then rang a bell and eventually the dog would salivate um, to the sound of the bell in anticipation of the meat powder and it's an unconscious association 
where um, a previously neutral stimulus, such as the bell, becomes associated with a pleasurable stimulus, the meat powder. Um, and so the proposal is that something similar is happening in addiction, at least for some people, and that the, there are variations in this type of classical conditioning um, that accounts for some individual differences in addiction behavior. So the um, two types are sign trackers and goal trackers, and this is a pretty broad generalization, but in general, sign trackers, for sign trackers, um, the Q stimulus is actually irresistible. Um, so the dopamine pathway, this mesolimbic pathway, has been hijacked and is associated with a Q, such as maybe a syringe, um, and the, the Q is actually sought more than the actual drug. So the, the Q is sought in the absence of the pleasurable experience. Um, so more than the effects of the drug is what I'm saying. So actually using the drug is more, um, is more pleasurable than um, the effect of the drug. So for example, um, that person will find just the sight of the drug Q pleasurable. And um, again, this is supposed to be mediated by this dopaminergic mesolimbic pathway. The other type is goal trackers, where the Q stimulus is not as irresistible as in sign trackers, but um, rather they seek things that are more relevant to the actual pleasurable stimulus. So they won't find just drug cues as independently pleasurable, but will actually like um, try to find try to get the actual drugs. And this is believed to be not as heavily mediated by the dopaminergic mesolimbic pathway. Um, Due to Q salience, an important part of relapse prevention in drug treatment is avoiding um, having the client avoid the people, places, or things associated with drug use, and that can be really hard, especially uh, in a place like Hawaii. Um, it can be really hard to get away from your dealer, get away from friends that um, you might have used with, even um, sometimes people have to end relationships where they were, their partner was, was a drug user along with them even like moving to a new apartment or something, moving to a new neighborhood uh, can be a really important part of um, avoiding relapse because in part, they're avoiding these cues. So the mesolimbic pathway, we've been talking about that a lot. Um, to go into a bit of detail, it's this reward pathway, it's a dopaminergic pathway, and it's involved in the feeling of motivation and reward. So motivation to do something or to attain a certain reward. Um, and it's not just involved in drugs, it's kind of, it's involved in a lot of different pleasurable experiences and um, motivation in general, but um, it's the part of the brain that appears to be dysregulated most heavily when somebody is addicted to drugs. So um, it's composed of these dopamine releasing neurons that project from the ventral tegmental area down here in the midbrain, or the VTA as it's often called. Um, to the nucleus accumbens, which is part of the basal ganglia, and then that goes through to the prefrontal cortex as well, which if we remember is responsible for um, motivation, reasoning, all the higher level um, processes. The uh, mesolimbic dopamine pathway also receives input from the hippocampus, which um, is associated with memory and learning, the amygdala, which you remember is associated with emotion, the particularly strength of emotion, and then the medial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with memory formation, among other things. Um, the mesolimbic dopamine pathway also includes um, glutamate and GABA neurons, so excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Um, so you see there are kind of a lot of brain systems involved, even though it's mostly, um, or the, the primary function is dopamine transmission, but lots of different areas of the brain are involved and um, a number of different neurotransmitter systems are involved as well. Uh, importantly, susceptibility to drug abuse can have genetic components, um, and I think this is important to understand for a number of reasons. Um, some people who haven't had, some of us who have not had addiction problems might find it difficult to understand how somebody can continue using drugs even if it ruins their life, um, and I think a big part of that is just um, having, having literally a, a different biological makeup as well as different um, environmental influences, but um, the genetic component of, um, of drug abuse can be as much as 50% um, for nicotine, alcohol, and a number of other drugs. Um, 
as is the case for most psychological disorders, uh, susceptibility, genetic susceptibility to drug abuse is likely a combination of many different genes. Uh, different gene combinations can have the same effect of making people more likely to be addicted to drugs. So it's not a matter of finding like the drug gene, it's lots of different genes and lots of different um, interactions between genes that give people more or less of a susceptibility to, um, to drug addiction. Epigenetics, unfortunately, can also affect the heritability of these genetic components. So if a parent um, uses a lot of drugs, that can reduce the expression of genes that are related to voluntary control, and they can pass on this um, reduction of expression of voluntary control genes, um, creating uh, more problems with inhibition, behavioral inhibition in their offspring. Oh, and notably, um, the genes involved in um, increased susceptibility to drug abuse might be related to learning, to dopamine, frontal lobe functioning, impulsivity, kind of all these components of drug use. Okay, so section four, explaining and treating drug abuse. Um, there's definitely indication that prolonged drug abuse can cause brain damage. Um, in particular, growing brains are sensitive to drug abuse. Um, so kids in general should just not use drugs um, and certainly not habitually. Um, the frontal lobe can be particularly affected by drug use and the frontal lobe can, is the last part of the brain to stop developing and development can continue into the 20s, possibly even to the 30s for males. So frontal lobe development um, is a little bit slower in males. Um, and so uh, can extend longer, even into the 30s. PCP, ketamine, and DXM, um, which, um, as we talked about before, uh, create excessive glutamate um, transmission. This can, glutamate uh, tr can trigger apoptosis or cell death, and so um, use of these drugs can actually kill cells in the brain um, and will kill cells in the brain with um, extended use. MDMA or ecstasy, um, brain changes have been observed from long-time use, so um, MDMA is associated with excessive serotonin transmission um, and can cause, with chronic use, can cause lesions in the serotonerg serotonergic pathways, loss of gray matter, the, um, the neocortex, the really important part of the brain, can um, cause cognitive impairments and um, depression. So um, the dopamine parts of the brain get impaired, so there's not as much serotonin transmission causing depression. And then um, a methamphetamine can um, decrease dopamine transmission because um, it can uh, damage the dopamine pathways um, and as well make kind of make the dopamine pathways resistant to um, in endogenous and natural transmission of dopamine. Um, some people with, meth with really long periods of methamphetamine use develop um, what is essentially the same as schizophrenia, so prolonged and chronic psychotic features, even when they abstain um, from methamphetamine. Um, if you look on the right, you can see um, at the bottom right, brain, brain recovery with prolonged abstinence from meth. So there is some indication that after long-term abstinence from meth, um, the brain can this is um, dopamine transmission in the mesolimbic area of the brain, so the brain can um, recover and have normal dopamine transmission. Um, however, with really intense and extended use, there can be permanent effects that are not reversible. And then um, up at the top, cort cortical gray matter volumes. This is showing that um, individuals who have long-term alcohol use, um, often we see a reduction in gray matter volume. So um, brain matter is reduced, which is associated with cognitive and uh, emotional issues. Uh, another quick caveat to your text, there is a little um, box about drug-induced psychosis um, in which the um, authors of your text described um, a case study where somebody uh, experience psychosis after using marijuana. Um, a, a few issues with this. I, I study schizophrenia. I study schizophrenia specifically in, in young people. 
and um, many of my patients have used marijuana and there's a big debate as to whether marijuana can contribute to um, marijuana use can contribute to the onset of schizophrenia and the data is extremely mixed and highly um, likely to be misinterpreted so this particular um, in for this particular case study in your book, um, as with any case study, there sh it should not be inter overinterpreted. I think it was used as an example, but it should also not be um, interpreted by itself. In the main study that was cited, um, only individuals smoking cannabis with high THC had a higher occurrence of psychosis, and it was only a correlation. Um, so, as you hopefully know from Psych 100 and your psychology methods courses. Correlations don't mean causation. You can never infer causation from correlations. So um, in the study, there was a correlation between psychotic symptoms in young people or, or the incidence of schizophrenia in young people and cannabis use, this high THC cannabis use. Um, however, um, we can't prove that the cannabis use caused this. There is um, an alternative interpretation, which is that people who are at risk for psychosis might be more likely to use cannabis. And there's a number of reasons to believe that this interpretation may be valid. Um, cannabis has a sedating and anxiolytic effect, um, also an anti, or uh, yeah, anxiolytic effect. Um, and so people who are in the prodrome or pre-disease phase of psychosis are more likely to um, have anxiety and depression and may turn to drugs to deal with this. Um, and there's also some indication that um, cannabidiol, um, as I think we mentioned in a, or we talked about in a previous lecture, um, cannabidiol may have antipsychotic properties. So it's possible that people using certain strains of marijuana are attempting to glean antipsychotic properties from cannabis. Uh, it's not a good idea to use cannabis um, to deal with psychological problems, but it could be an explanation as to why um, there's this correlation between uh, cannabis use and schizophrenia. Um, so just uh, restating that it's best for people with psychosis, certainly best for people with psychosis, and also just best for people with developing brains in general to stay away from excessive cannabis use. Um, however, it's not, um, it has not been proven by research, and there's been quite a bit of research on this, it's, and it has not been proven that cannabis causes schizophrenia. Okay, so moving on to hormones, um, there are several, well, there are two main um, chemical classifications of hormones, and this is steroid hormones, um, which is just a steroid that acts as a hormone. This includes testosterone and cortisol. These steroid hormones are synthesized from cholesterol, and they're made in the gonads, the thyroid, and the adrenal glands, and they bind to steroid receptors. Um, the other chemical classification is peptide hormones. This includes insulin, growth hormone, endorphins. This is made by um, DNA, cellular DNA, and it binds to metropotopic um, receptors that in turn influence second messengers, as you learned in the last chapter. And um, these second messengers set off chemical cascades that affect cell physiology and gene transcription. There's also functional classifications of hormones. Um, so the chemical classification and functional classification, it's all the same hormones that we're talking about, it's just different ways to classify them. There's the homeostatic hormones, which um, as the name suggests, maintain homeostasis in the body. Um, homeostasis just means like um, like balancing, like keeps the body from not, from not being too cold or too warm, etc. So um, these hormones are responsible for um, um, balance of metabolism, digestive functions. Um, insulin is one hormone that controls blood glucose levels. So if you know anyone who has diabetes, um, they might take insulin injections. Um, and this is because the pancreas, which releases insulin, um, doesn't produce enough insulin um, in individuals with diabetes, and so their blood sugar can spike and plummet, um, and so they may um, take uh, inject insulin into their body to help them um, maintain and regulate blood sugar levels. Hunger and eating are also regulated by hormones. Um, leptin is secreted by fat tissue and this hormone inhibits hunger. And then conversely, uh, ghrelin, which is secreted by the gastrointestinal tract, induces hunger. So these two hormones kind of act in opposition to each other. 
Um, they're called the, horm the hunger hormones. Um, ghrelin is secreted when the stomach is empty, among other things. Low levels of ghrelin in individuals, um, uh, low levels of ghrelin have been found in people with anorexia. Um, so they might uh, literally just not feel as hungry. And then higher levels have been found, higher than normal levels have been found in individuals, especially children with obesity. Um, both leptin and ghrelin um, signal the hypothalamus directly. Um, gonadal or sex hormones uh, perform a lot of reproductive functions, um, create sex specific phenotypes, and so like the gonads or um, the genitals, um, and also um, sex, sex specific phenotypes like um, breasts in women and bigger hips and um, bigger uh, like shoulders and arms in men. They have um, an effect on the brain and body development as um, actually before people are even born. So there's a possible influence of prenatal sex hormones um, on sexual orientation. There's indication that um, females who are exposed to high levels of testosterone in utero are less likely to be purely heterosexual. And there's also some indication that um, males who are exposed to lower levels of testosterone are more likely to be um, homosexual as well. Um, one kind of interesting indication of prenatal um, exposure to testosterone is the ratio between the second and the fourth digit. So the second digit is the pointer finger and the fourth digit is the index finger. Um, and as the length of your fingers is, is determined in, um, in the womb, um, this is, has been pretty strongly correlated with um, exposure to testosterone in the womb. Um, and so there's been a number of findings that um, a, a more feminized or um, a two to four digit ratio that's more associated with lower levels of testosterone is um, equal length of the second and fourth digits. So if you look at the graphic on the right, um, in women, this is associated with lower, um, uh, higher fer fertility, higher risk of breast cancer, um, lower levels of autism. Autism is, autism is associated with higher levels of testosterone. Um, and lower levels of ADHD. ADHD is also associated with, um, uh, ADHD is more commonly diagnosed in males. In men, um, this two to four digit ratio, um, if it's, if the two to four digit ratio uh, is indicative of lower testosterone in the womb, they also have lower levels of autism, um, lower fertility, and uh, lower testosterone levels as adults. Um, if there's a more masculinized two to four digit ratio. Um, men are more aggressive, have a higher tendency toward alcohol, which might be um, like a, might be because of impulsivity. They have better athletic ability, um, which is also associated with higher testosterone in general, um, a more promiscuous, higher number of sexual partners. Um, and similarly in women, um, more promiscuous, or more, more likely to have more sexual partners. Um, interestingly, more likely to be anorexic or bulimic. Um, higher levels of homosexuality, which we would, um, again, has been associated with prenatal levels of testosterone exposure, higher testosterone exposure in, in females. Um, puberty is delayed, um, and women who have this masculinized um, two to four digit ratio are also more likely to be athletic. Um, and there's a ton of studies about this. People are really, um, really into this. Um, two to four digit ratio and what it correlates with. Uh, just be careful if you look online about it, just be careful about your sources, make sure you're getting reliable sources. Um, so sex hormones also, um, this is a highly contentious subject, but um, do appear to have um, some influence on cognition. And of course, as with any population studies, this is on average, it doesn't mean in all cases, women have certain advantages it doesn't mean all women are better at these things and all males are worse or the other way around. Um, any study of gender differences is always confounded by environmental effects and the effect sizes for these cognitive differences in general is very is rather small. Um, so males in general have um, uh, appear to have advantages in um, some spatial abilities, specifically the mental rotation of a 3D object. Um, 
And then females, on average, appear to have um, advantages in some verbal abilities. Okay, so the next function, functional group of hormones is the glucocorticoids, um, and this is steroid hormones. They're secreted during stress, and cortisol is kind of the most common, commonly known one of these. Um, notably, stress can be good or bad. So um, you might have learned about this in like Psych 100. U stress is like good stress, a stress that helps you perform better, um, maybe is like activating, and then distress is bad stress, stress that um, might kind of inhibit you from being productive, things like this might be really, really um, uncomfortable. Um, there are two types of stressors, two main types of stress responses in the body. There's the fast response, which is the fight or flight response, and this is mediated primarily by um, epinephrine, which is also known as adrenaline. And then there's the slow response, which is mediated mostly by cortisol. Um, extended or excessive stress response can be damaging to the brain um, and the body as well. So um, stress responses use a lot of energy, proteins in the body that could have been used for other things. Um, stress inhibits growth hormones. So um, there are studies where kids who are in very stressful environments um, just don't thrive as much, they don't grow physically or cognitively as much as their less stressed cohorts. Uh, stress inhibits digestion and it inhibits immune functioning. So if you ever felt like um, you were more likely to get sick the more stressed you are, this is probably true. Um, and then stress response, there's a, a high indication that it damages the hippocampus, which if you remember is one of the main areas implicated in memory functioning, um, so it can impede memory functioning. There's studies showing that people with PTSD have increased cortical response in response to daily stressors, so they're kind of, um, people with PTSD in general are just, um, their body is more um, ready to respond to stressful situations, possibly because of their past traumas, and so they have increased activation um, of these um, stress areas or these um, um, pathways in the body and the brain that are uh, that mediate stress. Okay, and finally we have the anabolic uh, androgenic steroids. So um, also just known as anabolic steroids. Um, these are synthetic hormones that are um, similar, chemically similar to testosterone. Um, they have anabolic, which is like muscle building effects, so um, athletes will use them, they're typically illegal, but athletes will sometimes use them to uh, enhance muscle building and um, athletic abilities. And they also have andro uh, androgenic or masculinizing effects, so um, they um, will increase um, like masculine features. They're used medically for testosterone replacement in men, so some men have like low testosterone um, so they can be used to sort of replace this testosterone, um, and also for the treatment of um, endometriosis in females. Um, there's this form, <laughs> there's a particular uh, anabolic steroid that is being studied right now as possible male birth control. Um, so um, females often take um, hormones to um, prevent pregnancy um, in themselves, and there is indication that there may be um, hormone regulation for men too that would, um, among other things, suppress sperm production. Um, and this would be reversible so that if they, just like for women, they can stop taking birth control and get pregnant, um, for men they would be able to stop taking this, um, this steroid um, and sperm production it appears would um, return to normal. Um, anabolic steroids are also used for male to female gender transitions. Um, and here's a video of um, showing like a one year transition um, of a woman who was on anabolic steroids among um, a number of other things um, who um, transitioned to male gender, um, or at least um, went through the physical transition um, to male gender at that point. Um, and you can see up at top, uh, up top here on the right is um, someone who went through that transition as well, who was born a female and um, went through to a male gender transition.
Okay, so jumping into chapter seven, which is the methods chapter, and section one, study of brain structure and functions in general, I am going to go through um, these methods a lot more quickly than your book did, and I will not ask you anything on the test that isn't in my slides for this chapter. So don't worry about getting too detail-oriented about the information in the book. Okay, so neuropsychological testing, these are tasks that are done typically with a psychologist or a neuropsychologist um, to measure cognitive abilities. So for example, um, damage to the temporal lobes would typically cause memory impairments, and we have a whole battery of memory tests that are associated with different um, specific functions in memory. So um, you might do a test with them if you suspect that their spatial memory is impaired. You might do this um, block tapping test where um, the experimenter taps these blocks in a specific pattern and the individual who's being tested who can't see the numbers on those blocks would have to tap it in the same pattern. So remember, they would have to remember the spatial sequence. Uh, if you like, there's this um, group of neuropsychological tests that you can take online. And a quick note, these are not diagnostic, so if you don't do well in one, it doesn't mean you have uh, necessarily a deficit in that particular um, cognitive ability. Any actual testing, diagnostic testing, must be done by a trained psychologist, um, and it must be interpreted by a trained um, psychologist or neuropsychologist. So lesion studies were one of the first ways that we started to understand that the brain and behavior are connected. Um, a lesion is damaged to any part of the brain, so this might be from a tumor, from stroke, from something being lodged in the brain, from traumatic brain injury. In humans, we observe the correlation between areas of the brain that have been damaged in individuals and how they act after the damage happened as compared to before the damage happened. In animals, um, it's a little more experimental, so uh, scientists can um, do brain surgery on a rat, for example, um, if they want to know what the memory functions of the temporal lobe are, they might cut those parts, do brain surgery, and cut the like, parts of the temporal lobe out of the rat and then have it perform memory tasks later to see how that affects their memory functioning. Um, many, uh, as I was saying before, many of the earliest links that we made between brain and behavior were learned from post-mortem lesion studies. Uh, because we did not have these neuroimaging techniques previously, um, the brains were examined after a patient died. And uh, one caveat, over time, other parts of the brain will start to compensate for the injured area. So as we know from um, the previous section on developmental brains, there's um, our brains have some amount of plasticity even into adulthood. And if it's damaged, um, the brain can... Um, other parts of the brain can, can sort of absorb the functions of the damaged part of the brain. So an example of the importance of lesion studies, um, there's an area of the brain in the frontal lobe uh, that we call Broca's area now, and this is um, because Paul Broca, a scientist back in 1861, had a patient called, who we know as Tan, um, and this patient had um, damage to the interior, interior frontal gyrus um, on the left side of the brain, and the individual could only say the word tan um, after this lesion. So he would just say tan, 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 um, as if he was saying something, but it, only this one word was coming out. Um, this led to the conclusion that this area of the brain was necessary for fluent speech production, as this was the ability that tan lost after this brain part was lesioned. Um, and this was backed up by other um, patient studies as well. This was, Tan was just the kind of the first one and the most famous one. So this area is now called Broca's area. Um, Broca's aphasia is the name now for what um, Tan was experiencing or expressive aphasia is another name. And if you're interested, there's a YouTube video um, of an individual with, with uh, Broca's aphasia. Similarly, um, Wernicke's area, another language area was discovered this way. So Carl Wernicke in 1874, um, had a patient and he noticed that um, had a patient with a lesion in the superior temporal gyrus uh, and this patient had um, was able to create fluent speech unlike tan but the content of the speech was absolute nonsense so um, the patient was saying a lot of words but and, and 
complete sentences correct grammar, but the actual meaning of the sentence was complete nonsense. And from this, Wernicke um, determined that this area of the brain, the superior temporal gyrus, was necessary for creating meaningful content in speech. Um, and if you would like, there's a video of a patient with Wernicke's aphasia. Okay, another and slightly newer um, way of studying the brain is to actually directly stimulate the brain. This is called deep brain stimulation. Um, an uh, electrode is implanted deep in the brain tissue um, and it stimulates specific areas to excite or inhibit neurons in those areas based on what um, the scientist or the physician wants to do. This has been used um, mostly therapeutically. It's a little bit too dangerous to use for just research. So it's been mostly used just therapeutically um, to improve Parkinsonian uh, tremors, so going into the middle part of the brain um, to um, try to stimulate the brain um, and decrease Parkinsonian tremors. It's also been used to stimulate part of the brain believed to be um, kind of uh, under-functioning in depression, and there has been some success in clinical trials of deep brain stimulation, relieving some people's depression. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is another stimulation technique. It's much less invasive, and this one can be used rather easily for research. It's just this um, typically figure eight shaped co uh, coil that elicits a magnetic field. Um, the coil is placed on the skull near the cortical region of interest. So two typical ones are the motor cortex up in the frontal lobe and the visual cortex in the back. Um, pulses of electrical current cause um, magnetic fields to change, which cause neurons in the cortex underneath the skull to fire. So a pulse to the motor cortex can cause your arm to twitch, and a pulse to the visual cortex can actually create a um, very minor hallucinatory experience, such as um, gray or white spots that are called phosphines. Um, this is um, a pretty, what's considered like a pretty non-invasive um, technique. It doesn't require surgery. It can be done by someone who's rather inexperienced. Actually, I took a class on TMS and they literally just brought us into a lab, showed us a couple things and let us TMS each other. Um, so let us do um, use repetitive TMS, which is just um, repeated um, pulses of TMS uh, to each other's motor cortices and um, everyone would uh, experience this like finger twitching. Um, so it's kind of an interesting technique that a lot of people are starting to use more and more. Of course, we can study the brain through um, drug manipulation. So this is administering drugs, targeting a specific neurotransmitter system, and then observing the effects, either through brain imaging or the behavioral effects. So um, one kind of, uh, to me, a surprising thing that we used to do when I worked at a psychiatric hospital as a research um, as a researcher was an amphetamine challenge. So um, this was a study looking at how amphetamine, which is a dopamine agonist, affects schizophrenia patients. And you might expect that it would affect um, schizophrenia patients quite strongly because um, overtransmission of dopamine is associated um, with schizophrenia, overtransmission in certain parts of the brain. And so amphetamine challenges, they would um, administer these amphetamines and then see how the brains of people with schizophrenia um, react differently to large doses or to doses of amphetamines um, versus people without schizophrenia. So um, there are several different ways to measure electrical activity in the brain. There's of course single cell recordings where you record um, just one cell and the action potentials, changes in membrane potential within that single cell. We talked about that earlier. Um, in some of the earlier chapters. And then there's electroencephalography, or EEG. And EEG is just looking at kind of bigger spatial areas of the brain and electrical activity within that. So you've probably seen the caps um, that people wear with the little electrodes implanted within those. And each electrode is recording the electrical activity of all the neurons below that part of um, the skull. There are two main ways that people use EEG. One of them is looking at event-related potentials. So um, an individual has the cap on and is shown um, 
a set of stimuli and each of those stimuli is, is like an event and they measure brain activity that corresponds to that event. So how, um, how the brain responds to, um, for example, like letters on a screen, something like this. Um, and then if you look in the um, graphic on the top right, you can see that there's um, different segments of EEG. Because the changes in brain electrical activity are so small, you have to do many, many um, trials of the stimulus and kind of average them all together. And then this um, creates this averaged waveform. And it's very quick, very good temporal resolution, meaning um, we can tell when things happen very close to the time period that they happened. So um, you can see down here this graph of the averaged ERP waveform. This, um, these events ha can happen in under 100 milliseconds. So we can measure um, something called the, the P1 component of a waveform that happens um, 100 seconds after an event occurs. And all of these waveforms um, have been pretty well researched and correlate with different cognitive events. For example, I used to do research with the P3 component down here. Um, it says it's at about 400 milliseconds. It's actually a little bit closer to 300 milliseconds. That's why it's called P300 or P3. Um, and this is associated with what we call oddball stimuli. So whenever somebody sees an unexpected stimulus, for example, if they're looking at a stream of letters and suddenly they see a number, that's going to evoke this P300 or P3 um, ERP waveform component in the brain. There's another type of analysis of EEG that's a little more recent. Um, it's called time frequency analysis, and this records changes in synchronized neural activity in the brain. So sometimes brain areas um, uh, create action potentials, um, all the neurons in the brain areas create action potentials together, and that's called like um, actually like when you talk about brain waves, that's more what people are talking about. So synchronized neural activity. Um, and this is measured in frequency bands. So down here in the green at the bottom, um, don't worry too much about the details of this graph because it's actually a rather complicated technique. But um, you, if you see down here the frequency in hertz, and there's 5, 10, 15, 20. So these are, um, this is measuring different bands of neural activity at different frequency levels. So at um, 5 hertz, this, is, this means that the neurons are firing five times within one second, um, for example. So all these neurons are firing together um, five times every one second. Um, and that is useful for um, things like sleep and um, changes in consciousness, changes in attention, things like that. Okay, moving on to anatomical techniques. Anatomical um, magnetic resonance imaging, or anatomical MRI, takes high resolution images of the brain, and it does this by measuring differences in the hydrogen content between different materials in the brain. Um, you don't need to know the specifics of this um, unless you take further courses, so I'm going to go over it pretty um, briefly, but essentially what you want to know is when you look at an anatomical MRI image, um, more dense materials are a lighter color and the less dense materials are a darker color. Um, so if you look down at this image on the bottom right, um, you can see that the skull, for instance, is um, very bright um, white, and that's one of the more dense um, materials in this image. As well, it's important to know that often in research and also medically, images are mirrored. So there's a left-right reversal. When you think you're looking at the left, you're looking at the right. When you think you're looking at the right, you're looking at the left. Um, so you see a little R and L in these images, and that will tell you what side you're actually looking at. MRI machines in general, uh, if you've never been in an MRI, um, it's important to know that you can't have metal materials or ferrous materials, like a specific type of metal, in an MRI facility. People who have done research with MRI were all a little bit obsessed with um, what happens when you accidentally do bring ferrous materials into um, an MRI machine, and there's a lot of um, safety videos on the internet of people who do that. So. If you're interested, there's one where they smash a watermelon with a um, gurney or something like that against an MRI magnet, because um, the MRI magnet is an extremely strong magnet. So even if you have something like a 
um, safety pin in your pocket. It can injure somebody um, who's standing between the safety pin and the um, machine. Um, MRIs take a lot of pictures, so like slices of the brain sort of, take pictures of each slice of the brain, um, left to right and then up to down, and this creates voxels, which are like 3D versions of pixels of the brain. So it's MRI, anatomical MRI is very good spatial resolution, the best spatial resolution of the uh, methods that we're talking about today. And then there's computed tomography, which is CT, like a CT scan. This uses x-ray, so it's um, rather different from MRI. X-ray absorption varies based on different tissue density in the brain, um, which creates this image. The CTs are good for finding tumors and lesions. They're less expensive than anatomical MRI, but there is less distinction, less um, spatial resolution, and less distinction between white and gray matter. DTI, or diffusion tensor imaging, also uses an MRI machine, but this is measuring um, movement of water molecules through white matter tracts, so it's, so it's um, showing connectivity between different areas of the brain. And then these images, um, you use a program to color the images so that it's easier to visualize where the different tracks are going, otherwise it would just be kind of a muddled, um, it, it would be really challenging to see where the different tracks, which tracks are connected to each other. Functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, you've already seen a number of these types of images, and this is essentially, um, again, you use the MRI scanner, and it measures which areas of the brain are engaged in the task. So this actually shows you functioning of the brain rather than just structure. So um, MRI actually makes its images by measuring different differences in the oxygen levels of the brain in different areas of the brain, so the comparison of oxygenated versus deoxygenated blood. More oxygen in an area means that area is more likely to be engaged in a task, and it's kind of, um, it's a little bit complicated why that is, so I won't go into it, but it's sort of the source of some controversy as to whether we're actually measuring function of that area or, um, and how good the actual spatial resolution of functional MRI is. Uh, however, in general, fMRI has good spatial resolution and um, poor temporal resolution. So we can we have a good idea of where the activity is happening in general, in which brain area, um, but there's a lapse of like two to three seconds between when the area is being used and when this um, oxygenated blood shows up. And so we don't, it's not um, time locked very well to the task that the person is doing while they're in the MRI scanner. And um, most of you already know this, but if you look on the top right, you can, um, uh, the areas, the, the colors indicate level of activation. And so the brighter the color, the, the whiter or lighter the color, the more activation in that brain area. And then going to this darker red means slightly less activation in that brain area. There's uh, one con of fMRI is that there's a high likelihood for false positives. So false positive means um, finding what we think is significant activity in an area of the brain when there actually isn't. And this is because the brain, um, in part, it's because the brain is um, sort of active all the time. And so you have to um, compare the activity against like a baseline or a resting state. Um, there's also a statistical reason called multiple comparison correction um, that I won't go into, but um, people complain about that a lot for fMRI, that um, you're doing so many comparisons, like so many statistical tests, that there's a higher likelihood that you're going to find false positives. If you um, have taken statistics, maybe you remember why that is. There's this famous story of the dead salmon where um, when you're testing your MRI equipment, sometimes you use um, what's called a mask, or you just put sort of an object that you can see inside so often, um, well, inside the image, uh, inside the scanner, so some people use like a watermelon. Um, this one lab used a dead salmon um, to test the scanner and, and their program before they used it for participants. And just by chance, um, because of this um, high likelihood for false positives, activity showed up in the brain of the dead salmon. Um, so you can see over here, this is a picture of that dead salmon. Um, so this red activity showed up and it just happened to be in the brain region of the dead salmon. 
and a lot of people took this as an illustration of um, the high likelihood for false positives of fMRI research and that we should be careful when we interpret fMRI research. Um, in general, you can trust MRI research. Um, many of these studies have been done over and over again, and the same results have been found, as one should always do in good science. Um, but it's always good to keep in mind um, the drawbacks of any imaging technique. So then there's PET, um, and this is used to study metabolic activity in brain cells. Um, water with radioactive mo molecules are injected into the person's blood, and PET is useful because it can detect neurotransmitter activity, um, the density of um, receptors for neurotransmitters, and other things that functional MRI cannot. Functional MRI just looks at differences in oxygenated blood. Um, a drawback of PET is that it has pretty poor spatial resolution compared to fMRI. Um, and also you have to inject people with radioactive molecules, which isn't dangerous, but um, can some people don't like to do that, especially for research. In imaging, it's become more and more common to combine techniques. So um, as you probably picked up throughout this section, every method has its strengths and its weaknesses, and combining techniques can combine strengths. So um, a really great combined method is EEG plus um, fMRI or structural MRI. So EEG has good temporal resolution, poor spatial resolution, MRI, fMRI has um, really good spatial resolution and poor temporal resolution. So you add them together and you get good spatial and temporal resolution. Another thing people often do is look at um, people who have lesions in their brain with brain, any kind of brain injury um, imaging to see if there are functional and structural differences. Neuropsychology or like cognitive tasks can be used along with brain imaging to see if there's um, differences in the size or um, thickness of the cortex for people with different cognitive abilities and many more.